Oh, I mean, I think at the very beginning, um, and I think you see this with, uh, there was a march in Philadelphia that they did that was, you know, at the uh, Liberty Bell and and people were told to dress Mm. like in their work clothes and just look like like normal people, like everyone else. Um, Like normal people. Like like, look like normal people (laughs) with like air quotes around it. Um, But I think that uh, that trans people were like, were not the way that they wanted to portray their community. Um, and so they mm-hmm. were very mm-hmm. exclusionary at the, uh, in the early pride parades of trans people. Yeah. And I think they, I think the LGBT community is still in many ways, very exclusive and exclusionary. I will also talk about this for a bit. In yeah. My I think that pride can be yeah. a lot like that, especially because it has like a lot of corporate sponsorship now and it's yeah. very like, you know, it's fun party, but you know, this is why there are, there's trans pride and there's dyke marches and there are other things that go along with it because they don't feel represented by the official pride. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. The, the response though, to this like exclusion, uh, in the 1973 pride parade was that they marched ahead of the parade as a, as a form of protest. Um, which I thought was Mm -hmm. great. Uh, like (laughs) you won't let us be in our parade. Fine. We'll just walk ahead of your parade and we'll, you know, we will be a very like stark reminder that we are not unified and that you are excluding us, which I, I appreciated. Yeah. Um, me too. (laughs) So, and during a gay rights rally in New York in the early seventies, a reporter asked her why, why they were demonstrating and why they were protesting. And she shouted into the microphone, darling, I want my gay rights now. So, um, you know, (laughs) her gay rights were maybe because of her kind of intersectional identity. She identified as a a gay black woman. Um, those, those Mm -hmm. identities, each layer of that is, is one different form of oppression, (laughs) uh, of being a black uh, person, of being a black woman, of being a gay black woman, of being a trans gay black woman. I mean, all of those things, uh, combine and saying, I want my gay rights now is saying that I have a lot of identities that, that deserve rights and they are being, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. you know, denied me. And it's not just about your gay yes. rights, but also about mine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. She was amazing. She did a lot of amazing things uh, right up until her death in um, 1992, I believe. And there's actually, yeah, 92. There's actually a couple of documentaries about her um, that I would that I would definitely recommend. One is called Pay No Mind, <clears throat> which kind of... Oh, Yeah plays on her yeah. own personal name. And the other one is, I think it's called the life and death of, um, Marsha P Johnson. And that's on, yeah. on Netflix right now. And it's actually it follows, mm-hmm. um, a trans woman in New York who's really trying to get her, her death reopened as a cold case because, um, there were reports mm-hmm. from people. So she died, um, in, in the Hudson river, which is the river, right. Um, by yeah. New York, she had been harassed as a, as a sex worker, as a, a trans sex worker. And there were reports that she had been, um, harassed by multiple people during that time. And that somebody mm-hmm. had gone into a bar and said that he just killed a quote unquote tranny named Marsha. So, um, and that mm-hmm. somebody saw that she had like a, a, you know, a, wound or a hole in the back of her head when they pulled her out of the river now that could have happened any number of ways Mm -hmm. but people within the community really wanted to um investigate it and not just list it as an accident Mm -hmm. as a suicide because they didn't think that she would have committed suicide um so yeah it's still unsolved and it also i think the whole thing also goes to show that as a black trans woman as a activist as a sex worker she her death wasn't taken as seriously as um, the death of a white cis person. Oh, agreed, agreed. And I mean, I think that that we see that just without adding the trans uh, aspect to it, we see it uh, in the reporting of of how we report like people who end up uh, getting kidnapped, people who end up dead uh, in the United States. And I'm sure beyond. Um, But it's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's sad. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
So there, <sighs> she still has a long legacy. And actually, mm. um, they are getting ready to, they announced this year that they will be putting up a, um, a monument to honor um, oh, yeah, I heard about Marcia that. Marsha yeah. P. Johnson and um, Sylvia Rivera, um, I think near Stonewall. But the, I, I do know that her name was one of the one of the first to be entered into the um, like LGBTQ rights, like Hall of Fame. But mm. this this monument that's going to be erected for um, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera is going to be the first monument to I think they said the first monument to trans people in the united states yeah yeah it is yeah i i, I read that yeah it's, which is ridiculous I, agreed there are a ton of other podcasts that are doing like more kind of ex- extensive mm-hmm. um, profiles on marsha p johnson mm-hmm. um one thing i do want to mention though is the marsha p johnson institute which is an institute that mm-hmm. protects and defends the human rights of black transgender people by advocating, um, creating an intentional community to heal, developing transformative leadership, and promoting collective power. Um, so mm. if this is something that means a lot to you, I would totally uh, say donate to the March of P. Johnson Institute. Find ways mm. to help support them, um, especially because uh, violence against the transgender community is um, on the rise. In 2018, yeah. advocates at the Human Rights Campaign tracked at least 26 deaths of transgender people in the, uni- in the U.S. due to fatal violence. The majority of these were black transgender women. Um, They were killed Mm -hmm. by acquaintances, partners, and strangers, some of whom have been arrested and charged and others who have left yet to be identified. And in 2019, we have already seen at least 11 transgender people fatally shot or killed by by other violent means. Mm -hmm. So the people who are being killed are black transgender women in particular, Um, but transgender people are particularly at risk because of their identities. Mm. So support organizations that are doing the work of protecting those, um, those people. Mm -hmm. And also I have a recommendation because you mentioned podcasts that do. Yeah. Um, extensive episodes on Marsh B. Johnson right now. The best one I listened to was by the podcast Deviant Women. Um, I think it's the latest episode, um, is really really good so let's go listen to that if you want more information on her life and on what she did her legacy it's really amazing yes definitely check it out all right so because your voice is already so strange as you can probably hear liz is a bit sick um she has a cold and um yeah so i'm gonna take over from here um and i'm gonna talk about another woman who i think was an affront <laughs> to Uh, the gay rights movement. So every time I do a lecture on the topic of bi invisibility or bi erasure, I always start my presentation with a picture of Brenda Howard. And I will also post one on Instagram so you can have a look. Um, And I then ask the audience, um, side note, uh, usually those lectures are in the context of LGBTIQ communities. So it's usually people who are familiar with LGBT history, at least a bit. And ask them whether they know that person. And not once have I ever received a correct answer. Most people don't know who Brenda Howard is, which I think is outrageous. I didn't know who Brenda Howard was for the longest time. (laughs) And I'll tell you why we don't know who she is or why many of us don't know who she is in a second. And I'll also tell you why it's not just outrageous, but also a structural problem. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brenda Howard was also born in New York City in the Bronx on the 24th of December in the year 1946. So since she was born on the 24th of December, um, she is what we in Austria call a Christkindl. And if you've listened to our Christmas episode, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) If you don't, go listen to the Christmas episode. All right. So and she died in the year 2005 ironically sadly ironically in june which is pride month and you will learn very soon how pride month actually is related to Mm. brenda howard and what she has to do with it all so brenda howard was an anti-war activist uh in in this case against the vietnam war and some biographies also state that this activism is what originally politicized her she also was a sex positive feminist she lived uh 
a polyamorous life. Uh, she was an LGBTIQ activist and more specifically later on, then also a bisexual rights activist. She participated and planned LGBT rights actions for over three decades and she was an active member of the Gay Liberation Front, ACT UP, that you already heard about, Queer Nation, the Coalition of Lesbian and Gay Rights, and she was the chair of Gay Activists Alliance. So, um, hold on a second. So, Brenda, uh, Brenda, P. Ho- Brenda Howard was, uh, was in many of the same groups that Marsha P. Johnson was in. <laughs> Gay yeah. Liberation yeah, Fund, exactly. ACT UP, like yeah. all of the like big activist groups that uh, yeah. were part of the like beginnings of the LGBTQ uh, movement. Exactly. But it's also not very surprising because they were both in New York and that's just yep. what happened in New York. So they were both part of that. The most important thing, however, is that without her, there would be no Pride Parade. Um, there would be no Pride Month because she basically organized the first LGBT IQ, which wasn't called LGBT IQ back then, but the first like gay pride march in 1970. And that was intended as an anniversary celebration of the Stonewall riots that Liz just told you about. So it was the first anniversary and they were basically um, doing a parade because of that. She also originated the idea for a week-long series of events uh, around that Pride Day. Uh, and that basically became the genesis of the annual LGBTIQ Pride celebrations that are now yeah, held around the world every June. But she also popularized the term Pride oh. together with two other activists, with bisexual activist Robert A. Martin, who was also called Donny the Punk, <laughs> and gay activist Craig Sco- Schoonmaker? L. Craig Schoonmaker, I think. Um, And they basically came up with that term pride as the term for the festivities. And that all of that is why she is often referred to as the mother of pride. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Also, I mean, she did so many things. So in 1987, which is the year I was born, yay, um, she co-founded the New York Area Bisexual Network, and she helped establish all kinds of services for the bisexual community in and around New York. She was a member of BIPAC, which is a bisexual political activist group. She was a regional organizer for BiNet USA, a co-facilitator of the Bisexual SM Discussion Group, and the founder of the first Alcoholics Anonymous chapter, which was targeted specifically at bisexuals, which is really amazing because bisexuals in all studies that we know or the data that we have are the one uh, sexual orientation group that when it comes to like health outcomes um have basically are the worst worst off um including gays and Beatrice, lesbians. is this because um bisexuals don't feel uh included or uh recognized or accepted within the lgbtq community what an interesting question <laughs> <laughs> i think i mean i think it's a complex um conglomerate of different uh reasons i think One of the most important ones is that bisexuals are neither part of like the straight majority, nor are they really part of the gay lesbian community and very often stigmatized in both of those groups. So they very often feel like they don't have uh, like a a community to begin with. Yeah, many reasons. Bisexuality is very often uh, rendered invisible in our society. It's... um, existence is questioned people who are bisexual often uh like have like con- the continuous experience of their sexuality and identity being questioned so there's many many uh aspects that lead to bisexual people having worse health and particularly worse mental health suicidality depression anxiety and of course all of that then can lead to drug and alcohol abuse as a coping coping strategy and that's the reason why it's very very it's like just a very cool thing that she, yeah, ma- like um, founded this alcohol- uh, Alcoholics Anonymous chapter, which is targeted at bisexual people. Also very necessary, necessary probably. And she, of course, also worked on the March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights, the March on Washington for Lesbian, Gay and Bi Equal Rights and Liberation, where she was co-chair of the letter contingent. So, I mean, I could go on forever. Um, but... Basically, Howard was a bisexual woman, but she was also openly polyamorous and she practiced BDSM. So she also is what we could call an affront to 
the gay rights movement. Yeah. And BDSM is totally one of those things where like people are okay, like making fun of it in movies and they're like, or they're like, 